So uh, most of the semester in this biology course, we've been talking a lot about the uh, systems and functions as they relate to eukaryotic cells. We identified some characteristics of life. Um, and we talked about various cell types. Um, we're going to take a few moments today to just look at these two basic types of cells and talk a little bit more in depth about the prokaryotic cell. Um, in general, at this point, you should be able to distinct, you should be able to readily identify and distinguish between a prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell. We've established that uh, the eukaryotic cell is a more complex cell in terms of its structure and function. Okay, this is an, a, a basic illustration of a eukaryotic cell versus this prokaryotic cell. All right, when we look at this eukaryotic cell, we see a very busy cell here. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of structure. There's a lot of things internally. Okay, we took a whole unit to look at a tour of the cell. Right, and so we see all these structures such as the nucleus. We see the endoplasmic reticulum. We see the mitochondrion. Okay, we see the Golgi. We see all of these membrane-bound structures that we don't see over here in this prokaryotic cell. Okay, so generally speaking in your notes, one of the main differences here is that we can contrast them just in terms of their complexity. All right, eukaryotic cells are very complex. Okay, they're larger in size. All right, Prokaryotes, prokaryotic cells are very simple. They're not very big. Um, there's a couple of similarities. If you had to compare them, you can see this structure here, the flagellum, okay? This is a very important structure on the bacteria cell, all right? And it aids in locomotion or movement, okay? Some eukaryotic cells can have this tail as well. Um, another point of comparison is this plasma membrane, all right? We already discussed that every single cell type has a plasma membrane, all right? That is an excellent point of comparison. Now, a point of differentiation here in general is the presence of this cell wall. So if you look at my cursor here, we have this green representing the plasma membrane, which is a structure that is common to all cells, okay? That's that first um, layer of protection that's gonna separate the outside environment from the internal environment, okay? But in bacteria cells, right outside of the plasma membrane, we have a cell wall, okay? This cell wall is an additional barrier, if you will, that's found on certain cell types, like in this case, bacteria cells. And also, you hear me use the term um, bacteria cells as I'm talking about prokaryotic cells. Uh, in general, when we're talking about prokaryotic cells, we're almost always talking about the bacteria cell. Okay, so write that down in your notes. When we're talking about the structures here and so forth and how they function, we're talking about bacteria cells almost exclusively, unless I say otherwise for prokaryotic cells. So we have that plasma membrane, but again, that's what's going to be common to all cell types. But then the bacteria cell is unique that it has this uh, cell wall. And there are some other cells that also have a cell wall like fungi, okay, or plant cells. Um, and then uh, bacteria have this other additional barrier or covering or protection that we'll call a capsule, okay? So this, this image right here I thought was a great illustration of some of the structural differences um, in the bacteria cell apart from that, uh, the fact that it's just a simple cell, all right? There's this plasma membrane, then we have the cell wall that's in yellow, and then this red represents a capsule, and that capsule is there for an additional barrier of protection. So the next point I want you to remember about prokaryotes is that they divide by binary fission. Okay, binary fission. We, now, we discussed replication and cell division already for eukaryotic cells. We talked about the cell cycle, right? Mitosis and meiosis, right? Now, for prokaryotes, the uh, cell division is going to be by way of binary fission. Write that down. This term, binary fission, is how uh, bacteria cells replicate. Now, this is a form of asexual reproduction. Write that down. Binary fission is a form of sexual, I'm sorry, asexual reproduction. And we know characteristics of asexual reproduction. We have already discussed this. 
asexual reproduction only requires a single parent, right? And this single parent basically will duplicate its genetic material, its DNA, um, and uh, duplicate the genetic content before actually um, dividing off and making two new daughter cells, all right? So binary fission is how prokaryotes replicate. It's how what replicate? Prokaryote or bacteria. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, some other differences that we can take a look at here, again, in terms of structure, is the fact that in prokaryotes, we don't have this nucleus and mitochondria and all of these other places. So one of the differences is the how the uh, genetic material is stored, okay? There is no nucleus in the prokaryotic cell, but we do have what we call a nucleoid region, okay? The nucleoid region is basically a area inside of the cytoplasm where the genetic material, which is DNA, is located, okay? So if we looked at this illustration right here, all of this blue on the inside represents the cytoplasm. That's just the inside of the cell, right? And then the genetic content, which is basically the DNA, is located in this what we call the nucleoid region. It's a region within the cytoplasm where the DNA is located. So there is no true nucleus in prokaryotes, okay? Write that down. Dr. Thomas, you said there is no, I missed that part. There's no nucleus, a true nucleus in a prokaryote. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, the next point here that I want to make is about the genetic material, about the DNA itself. In prokaryotes, there's usually only one chromosome, one single chromosome, okay? Now that's in stark contrast to eukaryotic organisms that have several chromosomes, right? Eukaryotic, or eukaryotic organisms are typically more complex. They're gonna have more chromosomes, more genetic material, more DNA. In bacteria, there's only one chromosome and it's usually a circular chromosome, write that down. That's also in contrast to eukaryotic organisms that we have linear DNA. The DNA in prokaryotes or bacteria are circular. So the DNA is located inside of the nucleoid region and it's usually a single circular chromosome that contains all of the genetic information for bacteria. Bacteria cells also have additional genetic material apart from its chromosomes that uh, are called plasmids, okay? These plasmids are extra pieces of DNA that basically uh, code for um, additional uh, survival advantages for the bacteria. Uh, it confers features like antibiotic resistance. It contributes to the virulence of the bacteria. So these plasmids pro provide uh, survival advantages. Okay, so this is extra chromosome that's coding for um, different genes that confer some type of survival advantage for the organism. Okay. So plasmids are found in bacteria. Okay, 
So, so far we were, we were just talking about some structural differences here that we see um, in the prokaryotic cell when we're comparing it to eukaryotic cells. So prokaryotes are very simple. They don't have all of the membrane bound organelles. They don't have a nucleus. They have a nucleoid region. In terms of the genetic material, we're talking about a single circular chromosome as opposed to the many linear chromosomes that are found in eukaryotes. Let's see what else. So the cytoplasm, we're clear about the cytoplasm. That's something that's going to be common to all cell types. This, this represented here in the blue is our cytoplasm. Um, ribosomes are going to be present in bacteria. Okay, ribosomes are found in both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. We know that that is the site of um, protein synthesis. That's where translation takes place. So yes, ribosomes are found within the cytoplasm of the uh, bacteria cells, okay? Could you go back to slide seven for just a second? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay, I got it. Um, the, other, the other point here is the plasma membrane. This is a point of comparison. Comparison is when we're looking at some similarities, right? Plasma membrane is the structure that's present on all cell types. Now, we spent some time already talking about this plasma membrane and what its job is. The major role of the plasma membrane is to separate the cell from its environment, right? That's that first layer of protection. Uh, we talked about it being mostly made up of phospholipids and proteins, right? Um, we know that the, that phospholipid molecule is what we call a uh, amphipathic molecule because it's got that hydrophilic head and the hydrophobic tail. And those phospholipids arrange themselves into that phospholipid bilayer. So we spent a great deal of time talking about this plasma membrane already. So this is going to be something that is found on both cell types. Okay. We talked about this concept of semi-permeable. What does this term semi-permeable mean in the context of our plasma membrane? Does anyone remember? What does that mean? If I say my plasma membrane is semi-permeable or selectively permeable, what does it mean? Anyone? Oh, we talked about this in great detail. Is it, um... Is it like... I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Like when something like pass it. I don't know. Yeah, you're, you're on the right track. You're on the right track. If I say like, this membrane is semi permeable or what is so what does the term permeable mean? If you, if something can be permeated, what is partially right? Partially. Mm, what does the term permeate mean? If something is permeable. Mm. Somewhat Nicole, I think you were heading there. Finish your statement earlier that you were making. Um, I think it's like I, rem I remember us talking about it, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like I can't. It's like I remember, but I don't remember. Okay, like so when it like can go somewhere else. Well, but, right, but can... only not to like another place or something. Well, that only that certain things can pass through and other things. Yeah, only start. Okay, yeah. Right. So if it's semi-permeable or selectively, it means that it's being selective or picky about the substances that can pass. Right. So remember, we talked about the ways that things can get across. We talked about like osmosis and diffusion. And then we talked about like the facilitated transport where we had the proteins in the membrane that helps to get things across. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what that means. So, so guys, make a note of that. The semi-permeable feature here is referring to the selective permeability that only certain things can easily pass through the membrane without 
additional assistance, okay? So we talked about things like gases being able to easily diffuse across the membrane and water being kind of an exception in that it's a nonpolar structure or molecule. But other, other like larger, more complex molecules, we have to use like um, uh, forms of active and passive transport to get them across where we have the channels, proteins that are embedded in the membrane uh, function as channels or openings to get substances across. I think we talked about uh, endocytosis and exocytosis, how we get things in and out. So anyway, this is a uh, important feature of the plasma membrane is that it's selectively permeable. Write that down because I'll ask you about that again in the final. All right. So, um, yeah, so uh, plasma membrane, we said that it functions as a barrier. This is going to be a structure that, again, is present on both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. We talked about osmosis. Uh, we didn't go a whole lot into um, osmotic pressure and so forth, but we did talk about active transport and so forth. But anyway, I'm going to stop right here as far as prokaryotes. In general, I do want you to be able to make um, basic comparisons between the structure and function of the prokaryotic cell in comparison to the eukaryotic cell. All right, so I'm going to stop this one right here, and I will post these slides into Canvas. And, and, and again, I want you to just focus in on the things that we covered in the lecture for these points of comparison. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the virus, all right? I cannot leave this class without talking about viruses because they're so unique and so important. Now, these are some very different organisms, if we can even call them organisms. There's a lot of debate on whether or not viruses are living things, okay? So in this Principles of Biology course, we want to just highlight some basic facts about viruses. And I think it's very fitting right now as we're dealing with this uh, coronavirus pandemic. But write this down. Viruses are very unique, okay? There's a lot of debate on whether or not they are living things or not because they can only survive and carry out life uh, processes in the presence of a host. So by definition, we say that viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. What does that mean? Obligate intracellular parasites means that they cannot survive without being inside of a living tissue or cell. So obligate intracellular parasites only demonstrate characteristics of life while inside of a host cell. Now that host cell can be a plant, an animal, or bacteria. Any living thing can serve as a host for viruses to survive. And that's why it's so debatable of whether or not they're considered living things because in and of themselves, they cannot carry out the properties of life that we talked about. At the beginning of the semester, we talked about things like reproduction, metabolism, adaptation, uh, uh, rep uh, replication. They cannot do any of that in, in by itself. Okay, so there's question, there's debate on whether or not they are living things as opposed to uh, being just sort of these infectious particles. Okay, so these are uh, parasites. Yeah, they're parasites by definition because they cannot survive on their own. They require a host. All right, these are very small organisms. Outside of a host cell, viruses are inert. They're in it. They, they cannot carry out any of life's um, properties. No enzyme activity, no metabolic activity, none of those other activities that we establish to be required for life. None of those, they cannot carry out any of those without a host cell. In terms of the size here, this image is here kind of as, as a reference at how tiny and tiny, tiny, tiny and small viruses are. This first uh, brown uh, piece represents a eukaryotic cell, okay? This eukaryotic cell is very, they're typically very large, 
in size. And you know, you've got your nucleus and all of the other internal structures. And then you have the prokaryotic cell, which is also very small relative to a eukaryotic cell. Okay. But the virus is basically like the tip of your pen in terms of size. It is tiny in comparison to our prokaryotic cell or a eukaryotic cell. That's crazy how something so small can like do so much oh, so damage much or like make you so sick. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And it's so tiny that we actually have to use a special kind of microscope. Write this down. We can't use a traditional compound light microscope, which is the microscope you would encounter in a regular, you know, biology class or microbiology class. If we were on campus, we would have done our microscope labs and stuff. We have to use a special microscope known as the electron microscope. Write that down. The electron microscope is required for visualizing and studying uh, viruses in the lab. Electron microscope. You cannot use a traditional compound light microscope for um, visualizing viruses. We need something with a higher resolution. And so, yes, Nicole, you made a great point. Um, these viruses can be very, very problematic to um, humans, animals, and so forth. Okay, one more term here, virion. Write this word virion down. A basic viral particle, okay, an intact infectious viral particle, okay, that which can, you know, transmit disease is called a virion, okay? There's two parts that this virion must contain. It's got to contain that nucleic acid, right? That's the genetic material of the virus. And viruses are, are unique in that their genetic material can be either DNA or RNA, so you have DNA viruses and you have RNA viruses. Um, wait, what other point was I making here? I lost my train of thought. Okay, oh, the components of a virion. So it's got to have the nucleic acid, right? And that nucleic acid is going to be covered or, or, or that nucleic acid is enclosed within a protein coat that we call a capsid, okay? So those are the two major components of a viral particle. You have that capsid and then you have your nucleic acid inside of that capsid. The protein coat around the DNA or RNA is called a capsid. And that's basically like protecting the genetic material. Okay. And then some other viruses have additional structures such as a envelope, membrane. You might have some protein spikes coming off of it, glycoproteins. It just depends on the uh, virus type. Okay. There are different types of viruses that all have different effects on us. There are some that can, you know, lie dormant and not cause very many problems unless you are immune compromised or so forth. And then there are others that can wreak havoc on us. Um, one last point that I want to make about viruses, because this, I mean, it's a lot of information regarding viruses. I want to make the last point that viruses can be identified based on its morphology. Write this term morphology down. Morphology refers to the shape or structure of the virus, okay? So virologists and microbiologists, those of us that study microorganisms, if I just had a uh, picture of a, of a virus or was looking under an micro, uh, electron microscope and I saw certain structures, I could make a prediction or an educated guess about what virus it might be based on its morphology or shape. Like if I saw this structure, I know right away this is a bacteriophage. These are viruses that infect bacteria because I see this head, I see this tail region. This is very characteristic of a bacteriophage. If I saw this, I could easily make a first guess that it's probably influenza, the virus that causes the flu, because it's circular and I see these uh, glycoprotein spikes coming off of it, you know, certain, you know, characteristics and features uh, in terms of shape and structure can help us to uh, identify viruses, right? And so, right, so back to the point that Nicole made, there are a number of different viruses that we have to contend with. Some are very, very deadly and potentially lethal. 
such as Ebola. We had an Ebola outbreak here recently in the US. Um, polio virus, that's one that we dealt with a lot back in uh, the early 1900s, but we've mostly eradicated it uh, due to the development of vaccines. Um, that's kind of what we've got our fingers crossed about with this coronavirus is some vaccine development. <laughs> and hopefully, you know, we can come up with something soon or else we're gonna be in some big trouble. Uh, influenza, we all are familiar with the influenza virus. It causes the flu. Every season we have to deal with uh, flu outbreaks. Vaccines help us deal with it. Um, but there are also uh, drugs available, Tamiflu and so forth. All right, I'm gonna stop right here um, because there are a lot of information uh, regarding viruses. But one of the things that you cannot leave this class not knowing is that, you know, viruses are unique uh, organisms because they cannot survive outside of a host for the most part, for a long time, okay? And that was one of the things that was so uh, intriguing and different about this coronavirus is that this thing was surviving on surfaces for a very long time and that's just uncharacteristic of a virus by definition, okay? The very definition of virus was, con was um, questioned <laughs> with this coronavirus. It was surviving for a very long time outside of a host. So anyway, um, characteristic features of the virus, again, is that it's an obligate intracellular parasite. It cannot carry out any of life's processes without being inside of a living host. You should be able to intelligently discuss what a host cell is. A host cell is basically any living thing, right? Plants, animals, and bacteria, those are all types of living organisms. Okay, so they can serve as a host for viruses. Okay, in terms of its functionality, again, outside of the host, it's basically nothing, it's inert, it doesn't have any enzymatic or metabolic activity in and of itself outside of that host. Okay, um, the nucleic acid of the virus can be either DNA or RNA. And then the size, okay? You should be able to intelligently discuss the relative size of a virus in comparison to a prokaryotic cell or a eukaryotic cell. All right? And then we defined a virion, which is a, an intact infectious viral particle that contained, you know, the nucleic acid and that protein coat caps it around it. That's our intact virion. I'll stop right here today. Um, I will get these slides or this recording up for you in Canvas. What I do want you to uh, work on, the, you know, once I get them up this evening is just going back through your notes, filling in and kind of listening to this discussion again.